You know what? It, it, it's an interesting thing is when we talk about love, uh, the reaction you get from people. You know, because we've all had good and bad experiences with love. And some of us like to think we're a bit above love. You know, like we don't get messed up with that. It's all that feelings and stuff, you know, those kind of things. But it is an interesting concept, and I believe this to be true. We all have incomplete lives until we are loved in a way that we can't understand. We all have incomplete lives until we are loved in a way that we cannot understand. There was a, a great Christian uh, thinker in, in 1076. He wrote, he wrote a concept about proving the existence of God. It was called the ontological argument they teach in first year Bible college. And Anselm of Canterbury, his concept was the fact that we have a belief in perfection yet everything we see and everything around us is imperfect means there must be a God. How can we conceptualize a God when there's no logical explanation around us to a perfect, loving, all-powerful being? Life is full of pain and challenge and disappointment and all those kind of things. And the same is true of love. We long for a perfect love. Now in English, we just use the one word love, but in the Greek, Back in the, the Greek days when they had a limit of vocabulary, about the fifth the size of the English language, they had many different words for love. There was uh, filio, which is a friendship love. Filio is, is like, you know, these are the people you choose to be friends. or the person you can just sit with and not say anything, you know, uh, or watch a game with or go hunting or sit down and have coffee. And, you know, there's, that person, you love them in a friendship way. It's a filial love. And then there's Philadelphia love. That is family love. You know, blood is thicker than water, and you love your family. You just love them to death, you know. And uh, you just, you know, family, you watch out for each other, right? I grew up with four sisters, and you take on one of us, you took on the whole trailer park, you know, because we were all coming after you, right? And, and that's Philadelphia love. And then there's eros, you know, if we get the word erotic from. That's actually one of my favorites. And uh, that's, that's a, a sensual love. That, that someone has for each other. And then there was a little used word, agape. Agape was never used by the Greeks because it was a concept of love that they didn't think was practical. And it was a love that was based upon someone choosing to love you unconditionally and giving themselves to you even though you do not deserve it and you have no means to expect it. And it's agape love that I think, similar to the ontological argument, we go through life longing. We long to be loved in a way that we can't understand. We loved, we, or we long to be loved in a way that blows us out of our socks. And until we find that love, our lives are empty. And many people try to find that kind of love in other people. They will find it in a boyfriend or girlfriend. They try to find it in raising their kids. They try and find it by adopting a small group. But the problem is, is people are imperfect. And they can't love us in a perfect way. In fact, psychologists say one of the leading examples of things that destroy relationships are unmet expectations. Someone becomes a friend and they think, my friend's going to be here with me. They're going to be faithful. They're going to do all those kind of things. And, and they let you down. They don't show up on time for something that was really important to you. Or we think, okay, if I get married, then I'm going to experience perfect love, and that doesn't last long. <laughs> we have kids, you know, and, and, and it's amazing how we're all experts on having kids until we have kids, right? <laughs> and it's really funny because we raise them, and then we forget what it's like to raise kids, and then we have a perfect concept of how to raise kids again, right? And we just go through these phases and stuff. But you may not know it, kids aren't perfect. The first time you got to lift that little butt up to your nose to smell if the diaper's gone or they're, you know, blowing their nose on your shirt and things like that. This is not an ideal love at times, okay? In fact, it's darn un inconvenient. In the middle of the night, you're up with, you know, barf and bart and, you know, things are just stressing you right out. And you're like, this is not a perfect love. It's a childlike, wonderful love. And unmet expectations is one of the greatest hindrances to true intimacy, in human beings, as we learn to love each other, we learn to love beyond our expectations. But here's something absolutely essential, is you will never find the meaning of life in another person. You never will. Because other people are like you, 
in need of an unconditional love. And so we all long for this love we cannot understand. We're doing a series called Paradox. And the Bible is full of paradoxes. And I want to just focus, this is our focus verse in this series. And it goes like this. It's from the book of Ephesians. And may you have the power to understand. So he's saying, I want you to understand, as all God's people should, how wide and how long and how high and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete in all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. This is a contradiction. It's a paradox. May you come to understand what you cannot understand. And what Paul was saying is, as followers of Jesus Christ, his desire is that we become more knowledgeable about a love that we cannot understand. And you go, how do I do that? You know, he's, he's saying two things at the same time. I want you to understand this, but by the way, you can't understand it. It's a collision of ideas. It's a paradox. How do we do this? And so today I just want to take a couple of minutes and talk about how we can grow in our understanding of the love of Christ. Okay? Are you with me? First of all, you have to understand part of the reason we can't understand love is the same reasons you know, and Dave Lux was great. He gave me a great list. He said, the, the car, carving can't understand the carver. You know, the, the person that forms the pottery can't, um, you know, understand the, the potter. Oh, what's the next one? Yeah, sheep cannot understand a shepherd. The creator cannot understand the creator. Human beings cannot fully understand God's love. It is beyond our ability to conceive. It is true agape love. And what many people do is they transfer the concept of God's love from what they know about relationships. And so their God becomes an angry person or he becomes really easygoing and, you know, and, and, and loosely you know, kind of watching things or he becomes really friendly or he becomes really mean based on what they know about humanity and things. But here's the thing, that's not true. There's a, book, a man named J.B. Phillips who wrote a book, Your God is Too Small, and he went through all the different types of gods people have, the, the kind old grandfather, the hyperactive um, control freak, all these kind of things. People tend to think if they understand God, it's probably a good indicator that they don't. Because here's the truth. We can know things about God, attributes to him. He's righteous and holy and wonderful and loving and faithful and all those kind of things. And we can get our mind around those and our heart around those in our heads. But one of the greatest ways to actually understand those things is when we experience them. You know, when we've been absolutely laid out and we reach out to God and we feel his spirit come on us and his acceptance and his love and his forgiveness. When we take the time where we don't understand something and we have two paths, we don't know which one to go, and we pray and agonize over it, and, and we talk to p other followers of Jesus Christ, and we purge through the scriptures looking, you know, how do I do this? And then suddenly it comes upon us, we read the scripture, and we understand the light comes on, and God directs us, and we realize God has our best interests at heart. He's picked a path, maybe less traveled, maybe harder initially, but it is a true path. And we feel that kind of thing. So as you experience it, it grows. And so what we want to talk about is that, I remember there was a movie called, well, probably everybody's seen Les Mes at one time or another. It, it kind of is reproduced every few years and comes out. And I love the beginning of the uh, movie Les Mes, the one that uh, Liam Neeson did. And he's a criminal, John Valjean. And he's just been released from prison. And the world is incredibly harsh to criminals. Nobody will employ them. Everybody mistreats them. Everybody hates them. And, and the military and the police are looking for reasons to throw them back into the prison they came from. And so John Veljohn, he wanders into a village. He's sleeping in the square, and a little lady comes along and says, you can't sleep here. Go knock on that door. They'll let you sleep there. And he knocks on the door, and there's a priest there. And he invites him into his home, and he gives him a meal and a bed and all those things. And John Veljohn is, says, you know, why, why are you doing this for me? And the, the priest says, well, God is loving and, and John Joel John said, God isn't loving. I've experienced every harshness of your God. That doesn't exist. And as he goes up, he can't sleep. And after the priest and everybody have gone to bed, and so he sneaks down and he sees these silver candlesticks and the silver um, serving trays and all those kind of things, and he puts them in his bag to steal them to run away. And the priest comes out and catches them at it, and he hits them with one of the candlesticks and knocks the priest out and runs away from this grace-filled environment. The next day, the police find him. 
And they find all this thing in his bag. And they drag him back to the priest's house. And they say, we caught this criminal. And the priest comes out, I'm very disappointed in you, John Valjean. And the, and, and the policemen say, this, you wanted this man to have all these things? Yes, but he missed the candlesticks. I meant to give those to him. They're worth many hundred francs. Shame on you, J. John Valjean. And he took these candlesticks and he puts them in the sack, which basically quadrupled his value. And the police take the shackles off and John Valjean John is standing there with his stolen items and the priest comes up to him and, and, and he says, why are you doing this? He says, John Valjean, with this gift, I have purchased your life. You belong to God now. And he sent him on his way. A transformed man who understood grace. We do not in this life ever find meaning until we've experienced a love that we cannot understand. So how do we do that? Three very basic concepts that I want to teach you today. Some of them may be familiar, some will be the first time, but I encourage you to practice them, okay? The first one is this, is I encourage, encourage you to read the scriptures. There's so much bad press about the Bible these days. If you're ever watching a show, the kooky, nutty, violent, horrible people are the ones that read their Bibles, right? You ever see that on TV or anything like that? People have actually taken the Bible, which is the demonstration in the Word of God and grace, and they've made it out like it is somehow a weapon that makes people dangerous. It does make us dangerous, but not in the way they're portraying. I find it really hilarious. Somebody will say, oh, I can't read the Bible. It's too full of violence. Well, what are your 10 favorite shows? Uh, Game of Thrones, CSI, Criminal Minds, you know, Westworld, you know, all these shows that are filled with violence. People will list off all these shows. And uh, you know, who's obsessed with violence here? <laughs> no. Yes, the Bible's about humanity. It has good and bad. It's portraying the need for a Savior, the need for Jesus Christ. And what I want to encourage you to do, and this is for me, not from the Lord, but you may see the wisdom in this. I encourage people to read their Bible daily. And when you're reading your Bible, I would recommend this. There are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read a Gospel, then read another book of the Bible. Then go back to another Gospel, then read another book in your Bible. Then read another Gospel, then read another book in your Bible. And constantly stay in the Gospels. Why? Why would this be important? Does anybody want to guess? Why is it important that our Gospels are the center of our learning? It talks about Jesus, yeah. What does it say about Him? Yeah, yeah. His words, His actions. Grace. A summation of everything that the Old Testament is saying. Yes, yeah. The whole Old Testament points to Jesus. It all comes towards Jesus. And the more you familiarize yourselves with Him, the more you learn of the things He said and the things He did, the closer to understanding the love that you cannot understand you come. You can't read through the crucifixion, all the horrible things Jesus went through for you to cover your sins. A spotless, perfect person going through this horrible tragedy. Why? Because He loves you. That is a love you cannot understand. His disciples, who all abandoned Him when He was, was being sentenced to death, they all came back afterwards. And He loved them, and He restored them, and He challenged them. And they went and lived their lives in such a way that they had been loved by a love they couldn't understand. And they changed the world. Fishermen, tax collectors, zealots. People that everybody else looked over. Changed the world. Why? Because they had experienced a love they could not understand. So stay in the Gospels. Okay? That's the first thing. The second thing is memorize statements from the Gospels. Jesus says all kinds of things. He, he said, um, you know, love your enemies. Do unto others. Um, it's just a little bit of trivia. How many people can remember lines from movies? Go ahead. Make my day. Yeah. Nazis. I hate these guys. Remember that one? Indiana Jones? Okay. I'm dating myself. What's our other lines from movies? I'll be back. Yeah. <laughs> That's from Cinderella, right? Uh, <laughs> someone else. You can't handle the truth. Yeah, right. Perfect classic Jack Nicholson line, 
right? All these lines we memorize. Why do they stick with us? One of my best favorite ones is Steven Seagal. I'm going to take you to the bank. The blood <laughs> bank. <laughs> is that a, that's an awesome line. I'm going to take you to the bank. The blood bank. <laughs> Who wrote for this guy? <laughs> Why do we remember them? Why did they leave an impression on us? Because they're hilarious or unique or funny or make an impact on us. Or we he hear people repeat them. Or we watch the movie so many times that we memorize all the lines. Okay? This is what you do with the Gospels. Okay? In 1920, we would encourage people to memorize a book of the Bible. Okay? And, and often today in our staccato information world, we get little bits at a point. We're in the age of access and stuff, and many people begrudge this. You know, we can't memorize, you know, 50,000 lines. Well, you know, you can, but why don't you start with this? Memorize statements Jesus makes throughout the Gospels. Why are you afraid? I am the door. Father, forgive them. Love your enemies. Blessed are the meek. Statements he made. Feed my sheep. There's thousands of them. And if you are reading your gospel, take one of his lines. When I was becoming a follower of Jesus Christ, I had this Bible, and the, the, the man who gave it to me, a Sunday school teacher, told me to read Matthew. And as I was reading through, every time Jesus spoke in there, it's like it left off the page at me. And I thought, this person sounds, acts, and is different than anything I've ever experienced. It was a love that was beyond my understanding. And so become familiar with the language of Jesus. And then the third thing is import it into your life. Live it. You live it by remembering those little statements and following through on them. Love your enemies. That's a tough one, isn't it? Bless those who curse you. Do good to those that despitefully use you. Do unto others as you have them do unto you. Follow me. You know, we have these paths in front of us. What do I do? Follow me. His voice comes through. The Jews used to have a concept that was very familiar in Hebrew culture to where they understood the Scripture so much that it invaded their language in every conceivable way. I remember early in the book of Matthew, there's a passage where Joseph and uh, Mary move with Jesus to Egypt, and when they hear Herod is dead, they move back, and the person lists this Scripture from Hosea, out of Egypt I called my son. Like it's a prophecy. And scholars, like they're scratching their heads. They're going, why do you put this here? Because that wasn't what that verse was about. It was talking about, you know, the Passover and everything like that. Why is this doesn't seem like a true prophecy? No, but he was, the person was displaying a concept that Jews were very familiar with. Someone would say, I have this problem. And they would say, it has been written. This is what the Torah says. This is what the Word says. As followers of Jesus Christ, this has to become part of our lives if we're going to understand the love of God. Stay in the Gospels, memorize points, simple statements, and then inaugurate them into your life. What is a person who says, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they do? When someone has despitefully hurt you, what do you do when you do that? You're becoming familiar with the love because you come, your eyes are open to your own shortcomings and just how far God had to come to find you. When he says, follow me, and you have these two doors in front of you, one looks so good, and it offers instant gratification, and, and, and it looks so appealing, and then you hear that quiet voice, follow me, and you know the way that Jesus wants you to go. And you go, okay, I'll take a step towards follow me. Eugene Peterson calls Christianity a long obedience in the same direction. Memorize the statements and then live them and inaugurate them into your speech. Now, people are going to get a little weirded out if you come up to them and tap them on the shoulder and say, John, who do you say that I am? <laughs> okay? You weird people out with you do that, okay? But as you inaugurate it into your language, and as parents, parents, do this with your kids. Bring those statements into your everyday language. 
Stick them on your bathroom mirror. Make them a part of who you are each and every day and live them. So can you remember those three things? Because that's a sermon right there. Stay in the Gospels. Stay in the Gospels. Memorize phrases. And three, live them out in your everyday life. Okay, now it's your turn. For one, stay in the... Number two, memorize statements. Three, try to live, or live them out in your everyday life, right? One, stay in the Gospels. Two, memorize statements. Three, live them out in your everyday life. You got it? Okay. All right. How many people are going to try that? You going to try it? You promise? Because if you don't promise, God sees you. All right? Stay in the Gospels, memorize the statements, and then live them in your everyday life. And you know what will happen? You step into a new reality where all of a sudden, each day, the scales come off your eyes, and as you live life, you see the world differently. You come into a new understanding because when you embrace a love that you cannot understand, it makes you freaking optimistic. It really does. Christians who love Jesus absolutely do everything well. They love well. They laugh well. They enjoy people well. They grieve well. They cry well. They do it. Why? Because they have been loved by a love they cannot understand. Take God out of your box and understand you will never completely understand his love. But you need to pursue it. Stay in the Gospels. Memorize statements. Live them out. All right?